Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to welcome you to this virtual devotion from Mount Calvary Lutheran Church in New Westminster on this the second Sunday in the season of Lent. It's my prayer that the time that we spend together in scripture and reflection and prayer during this penitential season might be a blessing to you. Let's begin our time together with the prayer of confession. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Gospel reading for the second Sunday in Lent is recorded in the eighth chapter of the Gospel according to St. Mark, beginning with the 27th verse. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked him, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and, and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone who would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of our Lord. Lord Jesus, as Peter made his confession of faith, so may we also confess you as our Messiah, our Savior, that one who came to take our sin and to free us from every evil. And grant, too, that we might follow in his steps, taking up our crosses and following him. Amen. In Jesus' ministry, there was a time for preaching. In his ministry, there was, there was a time for performing signs and miracles, and, and he did all of those things. And then there was a time when Jesus would take his disciples aside in order that he might teach them and prepare them for, for their ministry. Our gospel reading this morning points to one of those times. Jesus and his disciples had moved from the, territory, the Jewish territory in Galilee and were, now, and were now visiting villages in the Caesarea Philippi area. 
And they walked from village to village. And, and as they walked, Jesus would teach them. On one occasion, on the way, Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? The disciples responded with a variety of answers that they had probably heard from the crowds. And they told them, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. Their answers were, of course, all wrong, but it's interesting the individuals that they came up with all had their roots in the Old Testament and all pointed to individuals in some way connected to the promises that were made about the coming of the Messiah. But that first question wasn't really the question that, that Jesus was an, interested in. The second one was, but who do you say that I am? It was important that the disciples would know who he was. And we might add it's important for modern day disciples to know who he is as well. Peter responds, you are the Christ. His answer was spot on. But soon we discover that Peter had little or no idea of what it meant to be the Christ. He didn't know anything really about the office and the work of Christ, the Messiah. Jesus needed to teach him. And he needed to teach the rest of the disciples. And maybe he needs to teach us too. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. What was the Messiah's job? What was he to do? His job was to pay for the sins of the world. He was to suffer many things. He was to be killed, and after three days rise. That was the work of the Messiah. And how did Peter respond to this teaching? Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. The fisherman here is, is rebuking the eternal son of God. One of the other gospel writers tells us what Peter actually said on that occasion. He said, this must never happen to you. Peter didn't realize it. But what he was doing was acting as Satan's agent. You see, Satan doesn't want Jesus to pay for the sin of the world. Satan doesn't want humanity freed from his enslavement. He doesn't want Jesus to do the work of saving people. And, and Peter, on this occasion, seems to be in full agreement with him. Peter was doing Satan's work. It's no wonder that Jesus rebuked him and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Where do you set your mind? Do you set your mind on the things of God? Do you want God's will to be carried out in your life? Or do you set your mind on the things of men? Peter had set his mind on the things of man. This must never happen to you, is what he said to Jesus. Surely God doesn't want you to suffer. Surely God doesn't want you to die. Surely God wants you to be happy and wealthy and wise. He wants you to have all the goodies of life. And doesn't that promise, isn't his promise that if, that if you really believe, that's what he's going to give you? You can hear that from a lot of preachers, but I'd love to find a Bible passage that promises that. What I read and, and what Jesus says to us this morning is the exact opposite. He tells us this morning that to put our mind on the things of God involves sacrifice and suffering and service. It involves taking up your cross and following him. Listen to Jesus' actual words. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. 
to put your mind on the things of man may well lead to getting a lot of goodies in this life, maybe even gaining the whole world. But it also means forfeiting your soul. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to forfeit his soul? Well, I'm glad that, that, that Jesus didn't listen to Peter. I'm glad that Jesus set his mind on the things of God. I'm glad that he went to Jerusalem and there the elders and the chief priests and the scribes did exactly what Jesus said they would do. They arrested him. They put him on a sham of a trial. Then they took him to Pilate and using political pressure, they had him crucified. Jesus died just as they said he would. But then on the third day, just as he said he would, he rose to life. Jesus did all of this to fulfill his mission, to take away your sin and my sin and to give us his righteousness instead. I think it's interesting to note, and our Bible class attendees will, will know this, is that part Mark wrote his text as an, an associate of Peter. And what I find most interesting is that Mark leaves out a few things that Matthew in his gospel includes. When Peter makes that great confession, Matthew adds, And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Jesus praises Peter. But Mark leaves that out of the story. No blessing for Peter in Mark's gospel. And I wonder, and here I'm just speculating, but I wonder whether Peter left that part out of the story when he talked to Mark because of what would happen next. I wonder, and I'd like you to wonder about it too. Do you think that Peter might have told Mark to focus on Peter the sinner, on Peter as the agent of Satan? In that way, those who would hear this account would have a deeper appreciation of the generosity of Christ's salvation. Despite Peter's great sin of being an agent of Satan, Jesus still suffered and died and rose again for him. And if Jesus can redeem Peter, the agent of Satan, the agent of Satan he can certainly redeem you. When we speak about Jesus, it's important that we talk about the right Jesus. And who is the right Jesus? It's the one who suffered many things. It's the one who was rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. It's the one who was killed and then three days later rose to life again. This Jesus suffered all of these things for you. This Jesus is the one in whom you have forgiveness and life, eternal life. Amen. Let's pray. O oh Lord, in these days of Lent, set our minds on the things of God rather than the things of man, so that we too might deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow your Son through this life into the joys of eternal life. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, you have given to your church the joy of proclaiming the truth that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us so that we might be justified by his blood and saved from your wrath. Grant to us the gifts of your Spirit so that we might boldly share this message and help us to confess it in word and in deed. O oh Lord, you rule over the nations of the world. May your blessing rest upon our Prime Minister, our Premier, and all of those who govern us so that we might be ruled wisely and in accord with your will. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, through your Holy Spirit, pour your love into the hearts of all of those who suffer in our midst. 
that their sufferings may produce endurance and endurance character and character hope that will not put them to shame. Grant to them health and healing in accord with your perfect will and sustain them all in their time of trial. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant to us, Father. For the sake of him who died and rose again, and who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.